Welcome to Leader Lessons Now podcast with weekly conversations on leadership lessons for new leaders to develop their self-awareness and help those they lead to a better future. Now, here's your host. Welcome back, everyone. We are into chapter six with Theodore Roosevelt. And this is still part two, which is around adversity and growth from the book, Leadership in Turbulent Times. This is an interesting chapter as we dive into the details. We find that Theodore's 49-year-old mother uh, died of lethal case of typhoid fever at 3 a.m. And then less than 12 hours later, his young wife, Alice, died from what was later diagnosed as acute kidney disease. Of course, this was a major devastation for him and required him to escape the political life by uh, going into his private life and and trying to find more meaning for himself and his future. And so he's quoted saying, I'm going to Cattle Ranch in Dakota for the remainder of the summer and part of the fall. And this is where he would say uh, one of the greatest life lessons he had was was cattling ranch and it was just the simplicity and the resilience of the physical demands of cattling uh, on the ranch and then and then the serene times by himself to think really built and rebuilt his uh, tenacity to uh, an ambition to move forward uh, with his political career as the seasons passed his depression slowly began to lift and by the end of his uh, now two-year hiatus roosevelt had emerged from his traumatic ordeal stronger in body and resurgent in mind as he emerged from the west uh, in a short visit to new york he encountered edith caro a highly intelligent intensely private young woman who had once been his closest childhood friend and ended up uh, marrying Edith and provided his temptuous nature with life-sustaining stability and sanctuary. So the book goes on to illustrate sort of this crucible experience of the death of his mother, the death of his first wife, and how this had intensified his awareness about trying to get things done in life as quickly as possible, which is interesting. It's almost like this retreat to Dakota, being a rancher, Uh, sort of gave him a rebuild or a new foundation to build on, but then came back twice as aggressive and hectic speed and a lifelong pattern of a confrontational and often abrasive mode of leadership that put him at odds with established procedures and sluggish metabolism of any bureaucratic institution. He became the Civil Service Commissioner of New York and has a quite a reputation about hitting the ground running um, and and seeing corruption and trying to root out corruption. He knew that he had to purge the leaders at the top, change the culture in which the individual policemen worked, and deal a fatal blow to the widespread system of graft and bribery that enveloped the police, the politicians, and the managers of thousands of small businesses. It was clear in this chapter during this time as he worked through uh, corrupt police officers, uh, corrupt politicians, and corrupt businesses, uh, it was staying true to himself around uh, what's right and what's wrong. And uh, an example was that businesses needed to be closed on Sundays, but some of the police would allow businesses to open if they paid the policemen. Um, and so, and then they wouldn't be fined. So he had to go in and, and close those um, close those gaps between the corrupt pol- uh, corrupt policemen, as well as you know the need for um, businesses to be open on Sunday. And there was a nice little outline about you know he didn't even agree with the law about them not being able to be open on Sunday because in many cases uh, uh, folks were working six days a week and long hours a day. And Sunday was the only day they had to kind of relax. But when bars were closed and areas for them to relax in uh, were closed, it created a high tension that uh, actually um, the community turned on Theodore about his approach with uh, closing the businesses on the Sunday. But from his point of view, he was just enforcing the law. Uh, So, you know, a step there might have been, 
if he was serving the people properly, is there something else he could have done to allow businesses to be open on limited times on Sunday or somehow influence lawmakers uh, because he could see that it was hurting the people by him just enforcing the law? So interestingly, he lost the public sentiment as a police commissioner of New York, but his corruption and crime-fighting exploits made him a compelling figure across the country. So he, he left the police commissioner for a post of assistant secretary of the Navy with McKinley. And this is an interesting outline in this chapter where he kind of, he kind of does something in a role and then he tries to get out of that role. And this was uh, repeated in his career. And, and it's, it's unclear to me about like, he wasn't chasing title, but when he went to work for McKinley, he's the secondary now when he was a primary. And now as a secondary with a leader right above him, he has to work with that sort of ingrained institution of a leader that really didn't want disruption, whereas he still had ambition for change in the country. And so he had to make kind of a lot of decisions behind the scenes or not ruffle too many feathers in order to uh, keep the stability of the office of the Navy. But it was a part of his personality to to try and, um, you know, move forward almost in a radical way that uh, that was against the institutions. I like this quote that says, for Roosevelt, being a subordinate was never confused with being a subservient. So so once again, uh, no sooner had Congress declared war on Spain On April 25th, 1898, then Theodore Roosevelt proclaimed that he would resign his Navy post and volunteer for the Army. And, of course, this is is a big um, shakeup because it's like, look, we need you in the Army now with this more than ever. I'm sorry, we need you in the Navy more than this, uh, more than ever. But he's like, no, no, I I did the work that I needed to do. I prepared the tools and I set our, our country up for success. They are prepared and now the work must lie with those that use them. I would like to be one of those using the tools. And so the idea was like, you know, I've kind of done everything I can in this role and it's time to move on to be uh, the most useful I can be. And so maybe there's something here where Theodore is trying to figure out like how to be how to be utilized the most in terms of what he wants to do, what matches up with his skill set, and then that guides his decision making in what type of roles he does. It's not necessarily about pay or title; it's just about how he can be util- how he can utilize his strengths more um, in these in these different roles that present themselves. And of course, when people look at that, they're thinking he's suffering a nervous collapse. Uh, he's going against what we need and what we support. Uh, and Theodore is just sort of revolutionary. Uh, finding his own path against what his strengths are. So when he when he said he wanted to uh, go to the army, the top leadership post was offered to him from the Secretary of War, in which he declined. He declined and actually recommended uh, Leonard Wood because he knew that he lacked the experience. He Theodore and the technical knowledge to speedily outfit and provision a regimen. So it's this, it's this critical leader attribute where self-awareness allows you to analyze your own strengths and compensate for your own weaknesses and allow that to guide your uh, direction for the proper position for you to be successful. So now he's in charge of men uh, and, and builds a diverse team of men that uh, he leads by role modeling and, and has this assertive, only forward type of, of approach. And it was this propelling your troops toward the enemy. And it's uh, Kettle Hill and San Juan Hill where he's ascending the hill on horseback and he's pushing his team forward. He's at the front of the pack. Uh, of course, it's coming with risk because he could easily be picked off uh, by by the by guns. But it's this: I will carry you forward, follow me, uh, and shouting to his men to follow until they reached um, the Spanish retreat and reached the summit. And then once they uh, took the hill, it's this cheering and filling the air with cowboy yells. And within short order, the city of Santiago was captured and the Spanish surrendered. So it's this iconic image of man on horseback that led to the emblem of the American valor, which Roosevelt represented. 
So there's a nice story in here where he comes back to run for governor, but uh, gets pushed in the vice presidency role where he said uh, it's a useless and empty position. It seemed like, you know, his, uh, his those that opposed him had won and he was uh, kind of just stuck in a role that he didn't think he could add much value in. And then all of a sudden, uh, on September 6, 1901, an assassin's bullet brought McKinley's life to a slow end. And at 42 years of age, Theodore Roosevelt was shot into the presidency, the youngest man to occupy the White House in the, in the history of the country. So there's two clear things that I learned in this chapter about Theodore Roosevelt. One, uh, he was wise enough to retreat uh, from the death of his wife and mother in order to rebuild a foundation of ambition to move him forward. He stayed true to his values, which is there is right and there is wrong. And to orient yourself on the right means that you have to also root out the corrupt. But some of the institutions can be highly corrupt and will win. But in the end, uh, somehow there's a way that a path is paved in order for you to exercise your strengths. And it seemed like Theodore, I really respect, it seemed like he was always searching for the path where he could be his best, whether it was a linear path, a zigzag, a backwards path, you know, uh, it wasn't about power. It was about what role can I be successful in because though, because I have self-identified strengths that will be utilized the most. So for me, that was a really great lesson and, um, and, and not trying to control the destiny, but be the best where you are. And it seems like the path sort of opened up for him in a way that was unexpected and unplanned. So that was fantastic. So the next chapter is chapter seven, which is Franklin Roosevelt. And we'll learn a little bit about some of the obstacles he had to overcome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Leader Lessons Now. Check back weekly for new episodes. And please subscribe to this channel if you want to stay updated on the latest leadership lessons.